The Lord is pleased when he can find an individual that he can use. And the individual we're about to listen to has been used mightily of the Lord. I assume the Lord is pleased. I want you to welcome Pastor C.D. Brooks. I want to say good morning to everyone, and may God bless you as he has blessed me already. I am very honored to be here on this particular day, and because of my sincere admiration of, for ASI, what it has done, what it does, what it contributes, what it stands for. I consider this a high privilege today. God was gracious to call me from dentistry to ministry. And I am so thankful that he did. And so overwhelmed was I with the whole idea, I thought God was calling me to impossibilities. And I needed an anchor. I needed something to undergird my faith, and I found it soon in my personal study, Christ's Object Lessons. All of his biddings are enablings. All God's biddings are enablings. There was a time when this world was lost through the sins of our fathers. Heaven took into consideration a plan of redemption, which involved also the cost of redemption. God, who owns the cattle upon a thousand hills, he doesn't count his cattle by head, but by hill. The gold is mine, the silver is mine. He doesn't really need us. But to fight greed and selfishness and other such immoralities, God has willed that we have a part in his work, including a financial part, as he seeks to salvage from humanity and build up the population of his entire universe. Love decided on a mission to this earth. Love was committed to that mission before the fall ever occurred. God had decided, God had determined. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, thy seed and hers. A Messiah is coming who will bruise your head. Now, Satan is listening to this. And then he caught the promise. I'm going to send someone, born of a woman. Now, I want you to imagine Eve gets pregnant. First time. And the devil is watching every day. The child is born. He fastens his eyes on Cain. Could this be Messiah? Well, he was wrong. When he saw Cain's attitude, his desire to do as he pleased in spite of what God said, even the devil decided he is not the one. But then came Abel, who wanted always to follow the Word of God, to do it as God said not according to his own opinion, but according to the Word of God. And he offered a blood sacrifice on on an unshared altar. And the devil worried. And he inspired Cain. And Cain killed his own brother. Still, Satan wondered, was he the promised one? Hundreds of years passed. Satan remained confused about some things. Yet his kingdom outnumbered 
the kingdom of God by scores of thousands. He seemed to have had more in his forces than God did in his down the centuries until Noah's time. Satan drove the world mad with pleasures of sin and sex and every other debasing element. Satan was doing his program always wondering, where is this Messiah fella? And then he heard God speaking to Noah through Noah's own testimony. Build an ark for the salvation of man and beast. Build an ark and preach salvation. And here was a man willing to do what God says. For 120 years, he preached his eschatological messages to the sport of the unbelievers, to hearts made of stone. And finally, it was finished. Methuselah, which means when he dies, it shall come. Methuselah was the living sign, and his death occurred. It's got to be close now. It's got to be close now. And one day, while they were in festivities and mocking and laughing and deriding, an unusual sight, animals of every description. I, I have spoken about this business before, and it seems to me that if I looked and saw a lion walking down the street with a calf, it, it seems to me if a wolf was leading sheep, I would be impressed. But science had answers. And they gave them, and the people continued in their rebellion until the door was shut that no man can open. Noah had predicted rain. No one had ever seen that, but now they hear it like dried peas on a summer threshing floor. They hear the rattle of rain as it strikes the earth. Dark thunderheads, thunderheads build up. It is being fulfilled. They knocked on the door on the sides of the ark. Noah, we, we, we believe you now. We, we'll come in if you'll if you let us. But it was out of the hands of Noah. And the rains came, the battering, shattering waters of the deluge, the plates of the earth were jostled about. The stones, the skeleton structure of the earth was changed and moved and broken. It was too late. And the Lord's servant says Satan himself feared for his own life at that time. One thing is sure, the patriarchal age was over. No more 900 plus yeah, old giants in the land. One man with a calculator, and they do everything with those foolish things anymore. That man figured it out, and he said there was an 81 declension, 81% declension in the lifespan. 81% declension in the lifespan. And it seriously affected the growth, the height, and the weight of men. God trying to save man inexplicably obstinate, hard, unwilling to listen, unwilling to do. And then the earth was repopulated, and there came a man on the scene of action whose name was Abraham. And God called him one day and said, get thee out from thy father's house, from your kindred, to a land that I will afterward show you. No wonder he's called the father of the faithful. Anybody would go if they knew exactly where they were going and saw a land flowing with milk and honey. But it takes faith to go when you don't know where you're going. When God said, I'll show you later. But 
with Abraham bade goodbye to his people and struck out with his possessions as a stranger in a strange land. The plan of redemption had been brought to his attention through a covenant God made with him, a blood covenant. He also understood the 400-year bondage of his people in Egypt land. Joseph had been the hero of Egypt. I never will forget when I went to Egypt for the first time, the smiles that curled across my hosts as I called Egypt the granary of the world. But then the Bible says, there came a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph. They had been driven down into the south. In fact, it's a strange country. You go down north and up south. And there was down there a man with hatred seething in his heart, a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph. He began his march down north, and he drove the Hyksos out of power and out of the land into the Fertile Crescent, a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph. But somehow Satan inspired him with a fear and an awe of a king called Messiah who would be born amongst these very people, stirred him up so much that he ordered the slaughter of newborn babes. And everybody in the Jewish race who had one of those was trying best to preserve him that was born to a couple, Amram and Yoshebel, a son. The mother had prepared an ark, pitched it with tar, set it afloat on the Nile, trying to keep him alive. Somebody knew, especially the devil, that this one would be dangerous. This one could be the deliverer. This one, growing up, could seize power. And Satan knew what the power of God could do. God had made this covenant with Abraham, and Moses was a part of the consideration of that covenant. That covenant flowed downstream, and it did not change. Isaac and Jacob were involved. It's wonderful to me to realize that even though this beautiful boy was born and his name would be called Moses and he didn't understand his role, God understood it. And the promise flowed down the streams of time not to be changed at all but to be accepted and believed by his own people. It would not fade into oblivion, and it did not pertain, frankly, to Israel alone, to the exclusion of other people everywhere. Israel, set free, would become God's witness, says. Israel, set free, would become examples to the rest of the world, the pagans through which they would pass. Israel would say something to them that they had never heard before, that there is a God who cares, and he offers salvation through the blood of his own son. Nobody else could teach that lesson like Israel. And Moses was chosen to confront Pharaoh. He said to Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, let my people go. Pharaoh was incredulous. He asked a sensible question, who is God that I should let the people go? He laughed at the idea. Why, he thought to himself, no God that I don't know, I worship this one and that one, but this one I never heard of, he's not going to order me around, said the Pharaoh, and God would have to teach him. Now, there are many who feel 
so badly toward Pharaoh. Do you know Israel asked the same question? When Moses went to them, they wanted to know who is God. Moses had to get the answer from God. I am that I am. What does that mean? I am whatever you need. If you're hungry, I am the bread of life. If you're thirsty, I am the water of life. But more than that, if your soul hungers for truth, I am the truth. He went back and told them, and they never quite seemed to have gotten it, but they at least were willing to listen. And so God sent ten plagues. Ten? Yeah, I think the first three had to teach Israel. But the last seven were experienced by the Egyptians alone. Finances were needed for this trip. I think God looked over his plans and said, I need ESI on this one. Right. They had to have gold for the sanctuary for the ark, for the candelabra. They had to have gold and silver and brass. These were slaves. Where were they going to get it? Well, there's a little episode that perhaps we haven't always caught. But when the time came, the people of Egypt had been so terrorized and flat out beaten that they came out with loads of gold and silver and gave it to the Israelites, pleaded with them to take it. Maybe you can appease your God and call him off. And they made them rich, instantly rich, these Egyptians. God saw beyond. God saw the sanctuary being developed. He saw the implements. This could not be shoddy. This would represent God. So they brought enough gold, even gems for the high priest's garments, God providing. I read somewhere that the trip should have taken 11 days, 11 days from Egypt to Canaan. But because of unbelief and murmuring and resistance, it turned into a 40-year nightmare. There were times when God seemed to have been on age. Imagine God saying to Moses, a creature, leave me alone. Why in the world would God speak to a man like that? As though the man controls the moment. Leave me alone that I might know what to do with these people. Moses hung in there pleading for their Savior. Leave me alone. And he even offered himself to die in their stead. Now that's Christ's job. Moses couldn't do that, but he could become a type of that. And he did become a type of that. And the wrath of God subsided until there was the roll, the low rumble of thunder on the horizon, and God said, I will forgive. A long and tedious and hard and unnecessary journey should have taken 11 days. Instead, it took quite a bit longer. It took quite a bit longer. Ladies and gentlemen, God has already, always, that is, God has always needed finances and financiers, people who are willing to carry his work forward. For God had to defeat selfishness and greed in the hearts of his own people. Even when Israel was allowed to go back after the second captivity and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, the Medes and the Persians handled the finances. God always needed someone who could do that. And then along came Jesus as a babe born in a manger. Poor heritage. There is Jesus. And then came an urgent message, Joseph, rise, 
take the mother and child and flee into Egypt. Now, who could just do that in the middle of the night? Maybe if you had time, you could find a, a father-in-law or somebody who could lend you, loan you the money. But to be told to leave now without consideration of where you would get the funds to finance such a trip, you couldn't go that far without finances. And I have wondered, how could he do it? Well, I discovered an answer. Three wise men came to visit the child. And I can imagine God impressed them. Don't go empty-handed, but take with you gold and myrrh and frankincense. And they brought these gifts and laid them at the feet of the babe. Now you've got the money to finance your trip into Egypt. My wife and I have been to the area called Monterey. Uh, they say that's the place where the Holy Family stayed until God bade them return to their own land. And they did. Monterey, the Savior of the world, escaping to a remote village with his parents. But the finances were supplied by God. Christ was that babe, the preeminent one, the conquering king, indeed God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. Soon a reputation would develop around him, and soon men here and there and from everywhere would get to know the plan of salvation. For before the foundations of the earth were laid, God and Christ were committed to the cross. Christ was seen as a triumphant one. After years of powerful, perfect, prayerful ministry, busy all day from here to there, healing the sick, opening the eyes of the blind, doing exactly what he should have done, he knew that his time on earth for now was growing quite short. And he would have to tell his disciples about their assignment. Now, who in the world? Hearing the words back there, a despised small group, who in the world could have imagined growth and prosperity and progress such as Christ envisioned? Go into all the world, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And don't worry about extra clothing. Don't worry about piles of money. Forget about script. I, I would compare that to credit cards of today, Bank America cards. Then, Lord, how are we going to do it? How are we going to handle this. You know, it's almost inevitable that if you follow a line of Adventist preachers, by the time you get there, they will have plowed the earth well. Last night, I listened to a powerful, beautiful sermon about a character who shows up in my message today, a man who was fabulously rich, a man who had the top education in all the land of Israel, a man who had the last word in the Sanhedrin, a man who had more money than he could ever use. That man's name was Nicodemus, about whom we heard so delightfully last night. He slipped over by night, and I heard uh, Dr. Kim talking about the fact that Jesus and Nicodemus must inevitably meet, but Nicodemus might have been a coward. He might have been afraid. I read all those various and various and differing ideas about him. He would come slipping over after dark. Now, was he a moral coward? I 
don't picture him as that altogether, but he certainly didn't have complete understanding when he did it. Fearful of his fellow Sanhedrin? Maybe so. I don't know. And what difference did it make? He had the last word in Jerusalem. Maybe after dark could have been the best time for him and for Jesus. He had some protracted discussions, and he couldn't just receive them as Christ passed by. They needed to study the angles. So he went by night to see the young teacher. The young teacher, he called him a teacher sent from God. He went by to see him. Nicodemus, the master of Israel, gave John an account of their meeting together. And there are a few other times his name mentioned in the various texts. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that most famous and oft-quoted text. John 3.16 was delivered to Nicodemus. But he heard much more than that. He was a moral man. He was busy with temple and temple sacrifices and their meanings as he talked to others. And now the young teacher says to him, ye must be born again. Oh, that could wake him up. You're talking to me. That is what you have to say to me. Not only that, but I have this to say. If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men. All men. Israel, Nicodemus' country, had become a narrow, prejudiced, little, uh, split-up nation with confusing traditions, getting hardly anything done that God willed for them. Nicodemus was aware of it and wondered what to do about it. But Ellen White says, at the best time, Nicodemus came to Christ. At the best time for him and for the church, Nicodemus came to Christ. He had a close friend, another rich man, Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph had prepared a tomb for himself and for his family. You know, when the venerable HMS Richard Sr. and I were having a conversation one day, and he began to describe this gravesite. Elder H.M.S. Richard Sr. wept as he talked to me. He said, Brooks, don't fail to go there. Don't fail to go there. We not only didn't fail the first time, but we came back to that spot to film Breath of Life. Richards wept in that garden which still has its wine press and which does not fit the descriptions or the descriptions of the tomb inside Jerusalem does not fit. This one fits. And he told me to look for three crosses on the back wall, Byzantine crosses. He told me the meaning of it. Richards did. What an experience. But then Jesus became poor. Jesus became poor. And yet the Bible had predicted he would be buried amongst the rich. We heard that last night. Richard said, Brooks, when you look in the tomb itself, you will see that one end of it has been extended. That's because Jesus was a tall man. And they had to work on it in a hurry. He said, and if you find the caretaker alone, ask him to do for you what he did for me. I was anxious to see what it was. I asked the caretaker. He knew HMS Richards well. And he went to the front of the tomb and he looked out and he didn't see anyone else coming. And he unlocked the bars. And I went in and laid down in the tomb where we believe the Son of God spent a little time. 
Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea begged for the body of Jesus. In those days, bodies like those and the two thieves there were like throwaways. If any family was interested, they could buy the body. Buy the body. But when these two influential rich men showed up, Pilate, who had made a mess of everything, signed the death warrant. And Nicodemus and Joseph took the body of Christ, washed it, clothed it partially, and perfumed it partially. Does that sound like a man scared to be seen? No, I don't think so. He did dread the hostility of the Jews, says Desire of Ages, who held him in such high esteem. But they were courageous men. Joseph surrendered his own tomb. The Sanhedrin found out about it, and they denounced the Lord. He will bring calamities upon Israel. In John 3, he didn't call Jesus Messiah, but Rabbi. That's what he was. And he didn't indicate which he thought was above the other, but he called him Lord later on. He then found it hard to associate Christ and his end to Messiah by referring to a snake on a pole. The Bible said, cursed is the man who is hanged on a tree. He had to deal with that, but he dealt with it under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. He looked for the Messiah, and he expected him to come with rich, powerful gestures before the people. He expected him to come with glory surrounding him. He expected a big celebration, but he's pointed to a serpent in a wilderness wrapped around a pole. Cursed the man who dies that way. Nicodemus, Ellen White says, in Desire of Ages, became as firm as a rock. He was a rich man, but he was as firm as a rock. Don't worry about financing the ministry and evangelism of the disciples. I've got your back, said the rich man. And he spent his money. He spent his money and became poor. Desire of Ages says he became poor, yet he faltered not. All of this began with a night conference in a garden when Jesus said to him, you must be born again. I am bound by the tyranny of the clock. I did want to say this, however. I believe that before you had your first meeting, I believe that before you stepped out by faith to accomplish what God has allowed you to accomplish, ASI, I believe you were conceived in the mind of God. And I believe that he chose you, and he chose these attitudes, and that's why you are here. That's what I believe. And therefore, yes, I defines me to a large measure. I'm going to skip over some things I would have said. I want to tell you about a large evangelistic campaign in one of the beautiful islands of the Caribbean. We put our people into teams, and my brother, five years older than I, whom I had the privilege of baptizing, he and his partner had a lady on their list and went to see her one day. She always seemed solemn and quiet. And on this particular day, her husband was chopping down the grass with a machete. And when they approached, he wanted to know, what do you want? And they told him they had come to see her. She had been coming to our meeting. He said, listen, I told that woman if she were baptized in this church, I was going to kill her. That's his own wife. And as he spoke, she came out on the porch. Didn't say a word for a while. Didn't I tell you, she said. And the woman said, but I must. On the day of baptism, thousands were there because all these people who normally go to the beach saw what was happening and gathered around. We had a rather large baptism too. And that woman was in the group to be baptized with a robe on. Ten men in the sea, ten associates out there with them, 
and 10 deacons bringing the candidates and 10 leading them off. We had a system and it was clicking when suddenly my brother looked and here comes that man apparently in a rage. And as he came, he saw her. They moved up close to her side. And he said to his wife, didn't I tell you that if you join this thing, I was going to kill you? And she said the same two words, but I must. You mean to tell me I'm going to kill you and yet you've got to join this? I must. He reached out and grabbed her shoulders. The men moved in closer, but then they couldn't understand what he was doing. He was sliding his hands down her arms as he knelt on the ground. And he said, all my life, I've been looking for a religion worth dying for. Hey, this one is worth dying for. Ellen White says that God will show you when you should sell your house and your land and finance his work around the world. An old man told me in Cleveland, Ohio, that people are going to have to come down and leave those expensive technological inventions, leave those large television screens, leave all of that they, they cherished, and he'll come out the front door and he'll take out his key to lock it and it'll dawn on him, no need locking it, I'm not coming back here. You throw the key down, you're off to new quarters in Christ Jesus. 